just a girl Like that I am the one But the kid is not my son mm. 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 We are just about getting to the point of the NFL offseason uh, to where free agency will be opened up. I believe that's going to be coming up in late March or early April. But the NFL franchise tag period has begun, and some teams have started to take advantage of that. If you're not familiar with franchise tag, it is the team's ability for a guy that's going to become an unre unrestricted free agent at the end of uh, at, at the beginning of free agency. You have the ability to franchise tag him, and you would pay him uh, in the top fifth percentile of the salary cap of his position, I think is how they um, come up with the figure that you have to pay. Basically, one-year rental, and you have to pay him, you basically pay him the base salary of the first year of a, a contract extension, for lack of a better way to put it. So... Think of the franchise tag as just the first year of what could have been your contract extension. And I say what could have been, you'll understand a little bit uh, coming up here when, when we get to it. But there's three teams so far that have taken advantage of the franchise tag. Um, and with the, I was kind of thinking about it, and at this time last year we already had Matthew Stafford on the Los Angeles Rams Jared Goff went to the Lions in that major trade that happened early on I think it was January when that trade happened so uh, we're already with the lack of movement that, uh, that has been shown and all signs are pointing to Russell Wilson staying in Seattle Aaron Rodgers is going to stay in Green Bay more than likely Green Bay is probably going to franchise tag Devontae Adams even though uh, it seems, it seems like if they gave Devontae Adams a real contract offer, that would be what, what could get Aaron Rodgers to play ball with them even more and stick around for his entire career and retire a Packer. Um, and it's starting to look like the trade market's biggest fish is going to be Mitchell Trubisky, and maybe even Mitchell Trubisky isn't really as uh, sought after as maybe GMs wanted people to think. So it's going to be draft first, Free agency, trade are going to be tied right behind it, but I don't see a lot of movement happening, at least at the marquee positions, the offensive weapon positions. We're not going to see all of this movement. I know Broncos fans, it breaks your heart that Aaron Rodgers, after nearly thinking you had him last draft night, to now sitting here and seeing him finish his 12 days of shoving goat butter up his butt during his poncha karma cleanse, and he's going to probably be staying in Green Bay. So the franchise tag period is going to have an impact on free agency. And uh, it also doesn't necessarily mean just because your team franchise tags the player doesn't mean that they can't get a contract extension done. Dak Prescott going into last season was on the franchise tag, and they were able to renegotiate his contract while under the franchise tag. And when that happens, they just I think they just absorb what the franchise tag would be into the first year of the contract and go from there. So if your team, if I'm going to mention your team and a guy that you would like them to sign and you're upset that they franchise tag him, know that there is time that they can make something happen. So first team that utilized franchise tag was the Kansas City Chiefs, the AFC runners-up this year. Orlando Brown Jr., the left tackle that they traded for on draft night last year from Baltimore, is franchise tagged. He's going to be getting paid $16.5 million. This seemed like a logical choice. Uh, he played well for them. Kansas City's offensive line wasn't a detriment like a lot of people were expecting, myself included, after they got rid of all their all-pro guys from the, the season before. But he didn't necessarily show you something that you're going to be like, he's at the end of his rookie contract, and he didn't show you something where you're going to say, yes, I'm going to lock this guy up long term. He's going to lock down the left side of my offensive line for years to come. Now, maybe he did, and you needed a little bit more time uh, they've had a, a full, you know, pretty much a full off season with with the draft, or at least a full OTAs and and camp um, to get something accomplished. And now we're sitting almost getting to free agency, and it's you know maybe the Chiefs need a little bit more time to come up with a, a figure that Orlando Brown Jr. and his team are are going to accept. 
but it was logical, it makes sense, and he now has the ability to either play himself into a bigger contract with Kansas City or make himself an even more appealing free agent to another team that's going to be needy at offensive line. And normally the guys like that don't go somewhere and have success, but then again, guys like Joe Tooney exist where you get traded mid-season and you go and, and have an all-pro year for the team that you get traded to. Sometimes it happens, sometimes it doesn't. Orlando Brown Jr. was the first one to get franchise tagged. Second, Cleveland franchise tagged. It hit David Njoku, their tight end, he's going to get paid $10.8 million. And uh, I think, I don't know if uh, David Njoku is a nice piece. I think in Kevin Stefanski's mind, the way his offenses ran, he could pretty much have a, an athletic janitor running routes and his scheme would be able to have the guy open so he doesn't need a high profile high high you know flash guy at the tight end position or anything like that he is going to um, he, he is going to just have a guy like a David Njoku who allows for a big target that's very athletic you remember him coming out of Miami his draft profile was that of a guy like a Jimmy Graham or uh, Tony Gonzalez, where he's super athletic and can make plays down the field. He lacks in the blocking department, but he was never. He's more of the tight end, where on those play action passes, he's the one going on the crossing routes because he's big, he's fast, and if he gets down the field, your quarterback can just throw it up, and he has a good chance of out jumping whatever little DB safety or slow linebacker is trying to cover him. So David and Joku. For the Browns, $10.8 million on the franchise tag. And the final one so far, up until this point of recording Monday night, Cincinnati franchise tags Jesse Bates. And this one was painful. This one, it, it, it almost, I, I didn't get it last year going into last season when they didn't want to try and, and actually get something done. Um, because in my mind, after that playoff run, you're going to get teams that throw the... the if they, did, if they hadn't franchise tagged him, he, he was going to hit the free agent market and make all of the money. And I'm not saying, uh, I don't think you heard me right, so let me say that again. Jesse Bates, with the playoff run and second half of the NFL season that he had, if he hit the free agent market and the, if the Bengals had not franchise tagged him, he would get all of the money. All of it. Everybody. Everybody would have to give him, you would see Jesse Bates, you would meet Jesse Bates, and you'd automatically have to hand him your debit card. Be like, oh, I'm sorry, you got all of the money when you hit free agency because you're under 28 years old, you're athletic enough to play safety and cover the fast guys in this league. He shut down Tyree Kill in the AFC Championship game, shut down uh, Van Jefferson and for a majority of that game when it wasn't Eli Apple covering Cooper Cup. Cooper Cup had like two or three really good plays, but that's, it wasn't a Cooper Cup-esque game because Jesse Bates was able to keep the coverage over the top of him. I just don't don't get it. I, I should expect it from the Bengals at this point. And really, you know, when I say this, it tastes like vinegar coming out of my mouth. But I should expect that they're going to be cheap and they're going to try and get the best players for the cheapest option. And cheap, if the cheapest option is truly just keeping them around for one more year on a franchise tag, Mike Brown is shysty enough that he's going to pinch his pennies and he's going to go searching for nickels in his couch and he's going to do that. Uh, so I should have expected this. But it doesn't, it doesn't save you any money in the long term. You're paying him $13.5 million. That's what you're going to have to pay a safety of his caliber to start for your team long term in this, in this league. Jesse Bates, I think you can argue with uh, I think you can argue with Derwin James, Justin Simmons. I think Kareem Jackson can be in that conversation. He's a top five, five to ten safety in this league. And you have the chance to sign him to a contract extension to play and stay in a situation that he loves because you know that he wants to stay playing with a guy like Joe Burrow. He has a feeling, he's, he's comfortable in this situation, he has a feeling with the city. He thinks that they're going to be able to come back. And the franchise tag just seems lazy. The franchise tag just seems like, oh, 
we're just banking on the fact that Jesse Bates is going to want to stay here. There's other teams that have just as good of a setup that I sure, I am sure will pay pay Jesse Bates all of the money like he's going to be getting when he hits the free agency market. And I wish it was the Bengals that were doing it. I don't have faith in the Bengals offseason right now because the two guys that they I wanted them to sign in free agency, they haven't. Uh, that was Jesse Bates. They just franchise tagged him. And that was C.J. Uzama because you can't manufacture guys that are the heart and soul of your team. And he is still a very capable tight end. Coming on, he, he looked good in the Super Bowl. He didn't look that slow. And now he's going to have ch a ta a, an ability... Like I said, keep my teeth in my mouth. He's going to have an ability to rehab that injury and come back and play at an even higher level. So get C.J. Uzama signed. I think you should have signed J.C. Bates. I'm hoping. That's why I said it. I hope that the Bengals are using this franchise tag just to give themselves a little bit more time. Now, they, they've they been like, they should have been planning for this contract negotiation just like they should be planning for Joe Burrow's contract negotiation coming up in three years. They should have been planning from after his after the rookie season. You knew this guy was special. He came on the field. He was the leader of the team. I thought it was going to be him and William Jackson for a while. William Jackson decided to bail. Jesse Bates has stuck it stuck through the shit with you. He deserves to be rewarded, and a reward is not a franchise tag and thirteen and a half million dollars. A reward is a long term. You are the cornerstone piece of my defense, and we're going to build something around you. That's what Jesse Bates deserves, and Mike Brown fumbled the bag right here. And I'm hoping that he picks it back up and he puts all of his money in it and just says, here, and, and Jesse Bates is going to be a Bengal for life. But I have very little to no confidence in that statement. Other, in other news, the NFL Combine was back in front of fans for the first time in two years at Lucas Oil Stadium in Indianapolis. Uh, I watched a little bit. I, I will admit I wasn't as intense. You know, We had Peter Andrasani of the PTV Sports Network on a couple weeks ago, which you guys can go back and listen or watch on our YouTube channel, The Far End of the Bench. Subscribe while you're there or uh, follow us on your favorite podcasting platform. Rate us five stars and leave a, a review. But Peter was doing... Uh, or is in the process of doing a mock draft for the 32 NFL teams. I was not as involved this year like I normally would have been. I did watch the, the highlights. I did watch the field drills when I was just sitting there at work and it was on. So I, I, I paid attention, but I didn't pay, I guess, detailed attention. But what I was able to gather, I found a person at each position group that I think made a statement one way or the other. Uh, and I'm going to do offense this week. Next week I'll talk about the defensive players. But starting with offense, I think quarterback, the quarterback that raised his stock tangibly the most, I would say, would be Desmond Ritter. Desmond Ritter had the high, had the fastest 40 of the quarterback group. He had the highest vertical jump of the quarterback group and the farthest broad jump of the quarterback group. And I believe he was top five in um, in the shuttle and uh, the quarterbacks didn't bench press. but So in the athletic, athletic department, Desmond Ritter checks the box that you saw on film because in my mind, the combine is a part of the draft evaluation or at least the evaluate, evaluation of these young players, but it really should be, the equation should read film or what you saw in person, combine results, on-field drills, your pro day, all that kind of stuff, and then you got to meet the guy, get it, get face to face, and and uh, that's what gives you whether the guy should be draftable or not. So Desmond Ritter, you look at a guy like Desmond Ritter, I'd say on film, athletically, he checks the box of a plus player. He can get out of the pocket, he can move, and in today's NFL, that's really what quarterbacks are are starting to do. Where you can maneuver in the pocket, you're still beating teams with your arm. You're not running all over the place unless you're Lamar Jackson or Kyler Murray for the beginning of the season. So Desmond Ritter checks that box. He can move. He's not a statue. He has a good arm. I think he checks the box of being a guy that for the last four years he's been the starting quarterback of a Division One program in Cincinnati and built that program into the first group of five team to make the college football playoff in this era. So that is a big plus in his direction. He's been calling his own plays 
for I believe the last two seasons because the coaching staff at Cincinnati had that much faith in him. So he's got, he's used to be having the pressure of being the guy that's going to run the show. If you get him with a coaching staff that can develop a quarterback, not in a situation to where he's going to have to come in and be the savior of your franchise. And this will be a common theme when we start talking about the draft and all of these quarterbacks in the draft. These guys are second-round talents. If you draft Desmond Ritter at the, in the second round and you develop him, you could see him being like a more athletic Jimmy Garoppolo or possibly better. Desmond Ritter has a high ceiling due to his athletic ability and his leadership that he showed in college if it translates to the NFL when he does get to that level. Next position group was the running backs. I thought Brees Hall, he was the marquee running back at this position. I have hesitation when it comes to Brees Hall. Obviously, he's athletically gifted. He was one of the fastest. He jumped the highest of the running backs. And when you watch him in the game, he he's one of those backs that have that does have the ability to just get the ball. He takes the screen 60 yards to the house regularly. He breaks long runs. He He's good about getting his feet up. He's good about keeping his balance and getting downfield. So Brees Hall has shown on film that he is a, a dynamic athlete and can do amazing things on the football field. I worry about is his workload from college going to affect him in the NFL. Has he carried the ball too many times? Has he taken too many hits? that when he does get to this league and running backs are already getting ran through like bad underwear, is it going to be a situation to where we, we see Brees Hall come in, have a stellar one season, and then get injured, start losing playing time, very much like a Christian McCaffrey or we're seeing Saquon Barkley, who we talked about last week, in a possible free agency. Um, and that's something to obviously keep in mind. I do think that whatever team gets Brees Hall, it will be a benefit, but it's just a matter of how long is it going to be a benefit. This is also a guy, the, first, the two guys that I've talked about so far, Desmond Ritter and Brees Hall, were multiple-year captains and leaders of their teams and kind of stuck with their team through a tough patch and it built them and left them, you know, you want, when you're thinking about building a company, you're thinking about, um, a, a player that you want in your franchise. Do you want the guy that was able to come into the rundown, you know, piece of crap? You, you want the guy that was able to buy the rundown piece of crap car and in three years after putting in all of his hard work, four years, five years, it's he leaves that car with the ability to run way better than he found it, like light years better than he found it? Or would you rather just a guy that shows a lot that like he can run fast and jump high. I, I would say that you'd like the guy that can build up the car. You want the guy that can take your program, especially in the NFL draft when you you got the high draft pick for a reason or good draft picks for a reason, and you see what the Bengals were able to do and go from last in their division and go to the Super Bowl. All it takes is finding those guys that are going to be able to help build up your program and your culture. I can see Brees Hall being very beneficial on a team like Detroit. I can see him being very beneficial on a team like Philadelphia. These teams that have talent, but they seem to lack a guiding force that will move them forward. At least so far in his college career, that's what Brees Hall has shown that he's been able to do. So he was my standout from the running back group. At wide receiver, it was another Cincinnati Bearcat, Alec Pierce. He is six foot three, 211 pounds, and ran a 4'4", 140. That puts him in a very interesting comparison class, and the player comps sometimes are ridiculous, but I enjoy them. That's kind of what my draft analysis is all about, is I try and find the player in the NFL currently that I can most find you emulate. And when I was watching Cincinnati this past season, I think back and I go, Alec Pierce was a great player. Alec Pierce was a guy that they would play at Z, they would play at X, they would play in the slot, he could line up in the backfield some formations. Maybe he'll take a snap. Who knows? Jack of all trades. Uh, and, and that's the kind of guy when you put it at, at wide receiver, it's a benefit. It's a benefit. Now remember, Odell Beckham had a, long, had a, a very important pass in the, in the Rams' playoff run. So I think about the Bearcats and I think about Al Pierce. And I go, I like what I saw on film. I think the kid has... Immeasurable talent, 
and now I see the athletic ability and, and the catch radius, and and you put it all together, and it's he can run the routes that Cooper Cup runs. Is he going to be as as dirty on it on his breaks? He's got a little bit of work to do before he gets to Cooper Cup's level, but he can he, he he's at least on that traje trajectory, and he can also play on the outside. He's big, strong, and when he plays on the outside, he's going to be faster than the cornerbacks that he plays against. And he's going to be able to out-jump and out-athlete a lot of guys that he plays against. And he's going to be somebody that's probably going to be disrespected, undervalued, and he's going to go to a place, start on a punt return, and break one to the house, and all of a sudden you're going to start seeing Alec Pierce jerseys all over the place because he's going to he's the kind of guy that you bring in to your franchise and He's another guy that will build your car by the time he's done with it. He was also in that class with Desmond Ritter where they came in and Cincinnati was nothing, going nowhere, All-American Conference, what, and it's UCF, there's a group of five and, and nobody else, and Cincinnati did what they did, had that undefeated run, and made it to the college football playoffs. So Alec Pierce was a major part of that as well. The tight end position... I went with the local guy right up the road at Fort Collins, Trey McBride, Fort Morgan native from Colorado. Uh, he's going to be, I think, another two, probably two, day two guy, probably round two, maybe early four. Uh, round late two, early four is where I see Trey McBride going from the CSU Rams. And I look at him, he's got a very similar build to a George Kittle. Uh, he's going to be blocking. He's a blocking tight end first, but he's athletic enough, and if he learns the route tree and how to manipulate read coverages like that, uh, if you get him under a good coaching staff, that's a big part of a lot of this combine stuff and getting prospects onto your, your team and moving your team forward, he can get himself to being an all-pro or at least a pro bowl level player each year. I, I think he's in this generation, he's got the possibility of being with these Noah fans and the TJ Hawkinsons, the maybe not so flashy, not as flashy as Travis Kelsey, but it, be a guy like a George Kittle that can contribute and be a major factor on a team, but you're also drafting in like the fourth round and it's a major value pick. Trey McBride is, your, is my major value pick of the 2022 draft. I'm saying it right now. And this is sitting here early March. I'm saying Trey McBride is my my most valuable draft pick. And the last group, old offensive line, my favorite group, the, my big guy that I like the most, Trevor Penning from Northern Iowa. The dude is nasty. Just, just pissed off. You know, like he... He woke up in the morning and chose violence and then topped it off with a little bit of uh, battery and assault. Uh, I They were showing highlights from his senior bowl, and he is literally getting into a fight after every single rep of his one-on-one -on -one drills. It looks like the defensive linemen just want to fucking kill him the entire time. Like, they want to... If they had knives in their socks, they would have been used against this Trevor Penning guy and he's a small school dude he's a big guy and moves very well he's he's getting this reaction out of the defensive lineman because he's a very solid player but he's big he's strong he's physical he finishes blocks he's the most aggressive finisher of blocks that I've seen since Quentin Nelson came out of Notre Dame and uh, this guy I'm hoping he falls to 31 just because that he's from he's from a small school I don't think it's gonna happen I think somebody's gonna be smart enough that taking this guy is gonna be huge for your franchise moving forward uh, a team in southern Ohio I wouldn't mind if uh, we got the uh, Trevor Penning train going that would make up for missing out on Penny Sewell and Tevin Jenkins in last year's draft so I'm hopeful but then again you know we all we all know what happens when you hope with the Bengals